Hey, Anthony, welcome to the show. Hey, bro, thank you for having me here. Definitely, dude. I wanted to start off about how you originally got into the health field and what's the big why that motivates you? Yeah, absolutely. So uh, long, story, long story short, uh, I was a long life athlete, played soccer. Uh, I had a spring tear and I changed all the time. A little depression. Kind of went into a workforce in a field that I wasn't really passionate about until I met a physical therapist in one of our fitness classes, and we just communicated. It embodied incredible just knowing what I could do with just movement, and knowing that movement is a medicine. Dude, I, I just ran with it. I ran with it. Now I'm currently uh, just finished my undergrad last year uh worked under multiple outpatient to acute care to now performance care uh performance and difficult work hey anthony thanks for coming on the show hey brody thanks for having me man definitely man i wanted to dive a little bit into what you do and and what your story is when what is your big why that motivates you yeah, absolutely. So I'm a performance coach over here at Apex Fort Worth. Uh, currently, I'm working with a multitude of populations from youth athletes, professional athletes, to adult fitness, and even our rehab patients as a tech currently. Um, I get to integrate all these things where I have a physical therapist, chiropractor, strength coaches inside with me. Um, what really got me here is I used to be a long live or a long life athlete. So I played soccer my whole life until I had a hamstring injury. And so that's where my hamstring kind of altered my identity. I um, always grew up as a soccer player, knew that I wanted to do it professionally. And once I saw that vision kind of getting distorted, I decided, you know, um, let me let me find another route. Mm -hmm. and so I was doing a, an adult fitness class, and there was a physical therapist. Never heard of physical therapy. Never knew there was this type of rehabilitation side with athletes in, in particular, really. But uh, that that was my big drive back going back to school. I was in a field that I wasn't passionate about. I used to sell cars, so it was just kind of something that you know, trying to figure out who I was. And when she, we, her, and I just had that conversation, it just kind of sparked that fire back up in me. I just finished my undergrad at UTA. Uh, now currently serving thousands of people just in the movement world, and knowing that movement is medicine is just it's crazy to be involved with it now. I love that, man. I love that you say that movement is medicine because that was a big aha in my mo uh, my life because people talk about exercise, exercise this and that strength training. But when you realize that as humans inherently movement is medicine because exercise is a coordinated set of movements. So... Mm -hmm. That's all it is. It's just a coordinated set of movements. So um, can you dive into a little bit more about uh, what you mean by movement as medicine? Yeah, absolutely. So like I said, you know, there is an organized structure for these drills, for these, uh, these exercises or comp uh, the complexes and stuff like that. But usually what I will illustrate or talk to our athletes is that you're not going into the field with this conscious thought of this movement. You're going in there raw. You're going in there, you know, expressing these motions, but you're not going in there consciously, just, you know, with the sprint, I have to be at this angle. I have to, you know, express this power output in this direction while in training, it becomes more consciously aware. Like, let's look at your shin angles. Let's see how it looks parallel to your torso. Let's see, we can get, we have these Kaiser machines that expresses their, that shows their power output. So we get to quantify these, uh, these different formats. And when we're able to do that, they, like how I like to tell them is that it becomes consciously training in here at Apex to un subconsciously out there on the field because now you're used to these movements. Now your body is used to going and expressing in 3D motion compared to just one plane of motion. That's really cool. So if I was... An athlete coming into your training facility, 
how would you go about like assessing um my physical conditioning um mm -hmm. what what would you go through as far as tests or screenings or things of that nature yeah absolutely so for one thing that i do and one thing i do love about what we do is that we're all individual so we get to incorporate many things from i've had inspiration from dr andy galpin and andrew huberman who shows what we call our smart goal you know specific measurable approachable um, realistic and time and so that's one of the components that then in the education course you learn like soap notes like what are subjective objective um some i'm trying to think of the other two letters but i'll have that down and then that's two components so usually i'll have a 30 minutes an hour conversation or that's just alone just a one conversation just to kind of see what the athlete or the person even wants to accomplish once we sit down kind of understand what his what their goal is, is that i'm meeting them where they're at that's my first approach is i'm meeting where they're at whether it's they don't have any movement that structure to they're an avid athlete or an avid fitness enthusiast um, so then we go from there once we do that, we'll go into a movement assessment. What are some movements that they feel comfortable in? And then what are some movements that they feel restricted or need improvement? In? And that you can kind of see it from, you know, whether it's resistance training to just even running. Um, I'll do, we'll, we'll, we'll do like a skipping assessment. Some of these people never skipped since they were kids. And just to see that they're uncoordinated from a skip is, is mind blowing to me sometimes. Uh, we get to incorporate those into our training. That's just as a warm up, you know. Uh, we get to integrate these whole holistic approach to them, where I'm trying to see what's the best in that hour session we have together, and optimize a movement pattern for you or a movement goal for you. Got it. And once you set these uh, specific goals, um, depending on the person. What uh, are some of your favorite uh, drills or training for performance um, things that you do in order to increase what they're trying to get achieve? Oh, yeah. I know this is a very broad question, by the way, but just in general. No worries. Yeah. Yeah, in general, I, I love the 3D motion. So we will have a vector circle around us and we'll hit all these eight points. So it's one sagittal, one frontal, and one transverse. Those are our three pillars with those. But then we have eight vectors around us. So we'll see, we'll do a lunge forward, lunge to like about a 35 uh, degree angle to a 70 degree to a 90 degree to 135, 180, just kind of see how they're moving in that plane. And what we go from there to progress it is either, uh, we'll call them jobs, jumping into it, like a hop lunge, or we'll go into a, um, and even from there, once we will progress it from those jobs, we'll go into a job format and then go into a sprint. So we know how we go from a sprint. We're not always, you know, ready for the action or play or when we're, when the game is going around, it's not just, well, different sports will have that. But for instance, growing up as a soccer athlete, it was just continuously, my body has to be ready for the 45 minutes just to understand, all right, it needs to go in this direction. If I have to turn 180 degrees, my body has to be prepared to, force or forcefully stop and then reproduce that same amount of force to just go back. So we get to go and talking about force production, force absorption, how can we transfer that? How quickly can we transfer it? So I know that was a really long answer, but I like the 3D movement. And then I like that we have these Kaiser machines that show the power output and then we go in relation to force production. That's cool. I wanted to know about um, how you think of, about the mind-body connection when it comes to performance. What is your uh, opinions on that? Oh, yeah, man. Uh, it's like how in the beginning um, with the conscious thought of like how this drill is supposed to be approached. Uh, I try to precisely state it for these guys to understand it. And they can't understand it. And that's the first barrier of uh, an obstacle for me. Um, once I, they've understood it, we go into a slow motion, just kind of seeing how their body needs to be in this approach and then showing them that your body may go from here to a deeper angle and how do you prepare that body to get in that approach. Then we go full on. So there's usually about a three to four rep on, on these, especially in our speed. We'll go into three to four reps just to see, okay, 
this is we're queuing, we're videotaping, we're doing it in slow mo, just seeing how they're you know, are they at the right angle? Is their shin flowing to the right direction? Is it the right vector that they need to be um, for their hip projection to come out? So there's so many avenues that we approach it, and the primary thing is to let them understand the concepts of the drill and how do we apply it to a real game scenario. When it comes to movement and performance, what are some suggestions that you could give to the normal average uh, listener of just movement, things that they can do throughout the day or when it comes to uh, posture or uh, stretching? What are, what are just some general advice that you could give to somebody to keep their body working well? Yeah, um, I think a big component is that my biggest thing, I'm a big advocate of about we're a movement deficiency society right now. So me, we're always sitting at a desk, we're in a car, driving around. Right. I would honestly say, if you could do five minutes just walking around your block, walking outside, walking around, just move, whatever it is. And even how we, we're discussing that even when we're sitting down, you know, we're moving our, our conscious thoughts with on a phone or just trying to read or something like that. Where if even you're in the space, you're always constantly thinking something is moving chemically, normally, um, not just physically. So I always, if someone would ask me, what is the first advice? Let's just get moving. Let's see what you can do. Let's see where. So a big thing uh, to kind of go parallel or kind of go off of that is own the space. If you can own that space, whether it's a sagittal plane of motion, whether it's a frontal plane of motion, whether it's a transverse plane of motion, you know, from grabbing grocery car uh, in the trunk of your car and you're having to rotate on that space. So that way you get comfortable with it. When getting down into your driver's seat, you know, learn how to squat, learn how to not having to hold on to something. Like you have those uh, quads firing up, learn how to engage when it needs to be engaged. And so those are my two big components of it. What about when it comes to uh, vision and how that affects performance what what are your thoughts on that um it, it, it varies so depending we'll do what are called like reactive drills so we'll have color tones we'll we'll do also audio cues um uh, and what i love about that is that we know uh, that we perceive visually faster than we would hear and so what's amazing is that you know I'll have a cone up, I'll have it behind my hands, depending on what color it is, I'll say a different direction. Uh, and they know from the visual cue that they have to go one of the left or right direction. And so if I say something completely different, they, you can see how they're processing and how it kind of either messes them up or then you see the improvement where not even my voice can now uh, conflict the decision making there. Now they understand that, okay, if it's an orange cone, I'm going right. If it's a yellow cone, I'm going left. And so those, those are the reactive in visuals that we'll see. When it comes to your idea of uh, bridging rehab to performance through fitness, can you walk us through what, what you mean by that? Oh, absolutely. So I had to write down the definition of performance. And when we usually think about performance training, we're thinking about athletes, we're thinking about elite players, we're thinking about, you know, in sports in general. But what it, what it really, or what I translated is to the action or process of accomplishing an action, task, or function. And so meaning by bridging rehab to performance is that I'm making sure that what, regardless if they're coming uh, with a total knee operation to a sprain ankle that we're going to accomplish and see their performance for that. And how do we do, uh, uh, objectively and subjectively find that that goal is through fitness? You know, there's like later on when we have the discussion about how physical therapy can be very mm, specific to a goal and doesn't apply to a stressor that it really needs to be if they're what I what I would say it, what what I find out is that when I have a when we have a patient that will recover from a rehab, go 
be going for back to their daily activities and come back because they either had a re-injury of the same issue or a new injury. I, I, I didn't like that. I didn't like that. Not only just the business, I didn't like it. it was just ethically. I just didn't like it knowing that we're supposed to be the providers to help them with this movement pattern. And that goes into this next question is what do you see with physical therapy? Because when I, I think of physical therapy, traditionally, it's like, okay, so I hurt my shoulder. So they're going to come in and, and we're going to work on that. But traditionally with physical therapy, they, they don't correlate that the body is so connected with the mind and that certain weird things that I can do, like with my hand over here can correlate to there. So, I mean, what are, what are some things that you see uh, in traditional physical therapy that you'd like to see changed, like that you already spoke yeah. Yeah, absolutely. So one of the big things is that we are hyper focused on the issue and not the root cause of it. Right. And when we cannot find the root cause, and I get it, you know, there's a lot of barriers too behind it, whether it's insurance or whether there's um, limitations for the visits or from the physician. I mean, you know, there could be multitude of factors that are causing this, but. It's like how I expressed in the beginning. I want to optimize that time that we have together, whether it's a 12 visits on six weeks. Let's see what we can do in those 12 visits. You know, what is the root? What is happening outside of it? Not just only on, hyper focus on the injury itself. But let's see what's causing it. Are you, you know, are do you are you a laborious person? Do you work construction? Do you, you know, let's shoulder it. You know, like how you said it, you know. We have this myofascial tract that people don't understand that yes you can have a left shoulder pain but who knows it could be coming from your right achilles you know the myofascial tract but we don't see it as a 3d or a holistically approach to it that i feel like at times and places from acute care to or acute therapy or physical therapy it's a different approach to it where they're trying to hit an objective trying to get them to where they need to go and then send them off to an outpatient. Once I see them at an outpatient, now we're trying to see, okay, how can we improve from them coming from an acute care? From there, it's kind of like pre-game. Once they're done with us at outpatient, it's just like, well, where do they go now? So that's one thing I do love about how we have a multidisciplinary facility that they get to see the adults that we meet from across all ages. I have a a client who's in her 70s just repping out pull-ups and it's just like you know you, you get inspired yeah you get inspired by the people that come in every day just to know that movement is keeping them living in that sense or you're hearing you're hearing the compliments like you know they had a bad day but they still chose to come over here just to get a workout in because they felt like they got the endorphins and they got their you know uh dopamine hit from us and it's just like and i don't even get to see these as clients i get to see my like, family members now so this is yeah like, <laughs> that, that's really powerful it's it's all about community and um, exactly i'd like to know what are some cool comeback stories that you may have seen working with clients oh man uh, there's been so many right now because uh, we always do like the highlight of a week of a client. And currently right now, uh, when I first started with APEC, what inspired me to go back to school, I met this one lady. She was in her upper, almost close to 300 pounds. And, you know, I see her every day with me and her just talking, you know, just getting to know each other. Eventually, once I've had enough in, uh, inspiration to go back to school, Cool. I let her know, I was like, hey, I'm going back to school to become a trainer. She's like, okay. And I was like, I'll see you later. I'll see you shortly in four years. Okay. Four years later happened, and I started uh, teaching the adult spiritual class. And I see her. I grew a beard. I was actually shaved face at the time we met. So we didn't really like, we didn't know if we, if we were the right people that met four years or now five years ago at that point. And then I was like, hey, are you, you, you know, who you are? 
And she was like, yeah, I was thinking the same thing. And so we just started chatting it up, rebuilding our relationship at that point. And what blows my mind is that during the four years, she was having such a troubling time. I mean, she went through a divorce. She, her mother passed away last year. And then not even the week before, she had to put her dog down. And I was like, but yet you're still smiling. You're still coming here. And she's like, this is my home. This is my second home. And I'm happy that I get to come here. And I was like, and at that moment, I was like, wow, like, I'm I'm grateful for you to even be here, continuing your journey, you know, that movement. And now, man, we started integrating our adaptive athletes now. So I'm working with amputees at this moment. And we're seeing them from different stages, whether they have slow gross motor control on their good bar to high level uh, amputees where they're playing sports currently. And just to hear this community, like, they, sometimes we will get unfocused from the movement from our training sessions just because we're having fun we're talking to each other everyone has now a story that everyone can understand and i mean i get inspired by these because these guys didn't give up and like that hits home to me because once i stopped being an at a soccer athlete i felt like i regret just giving up in that moment and now seeing that these guys get up with a below knee or a above knee or bilateral knee amputation and they're still moving they're still having fun they're still i was like there's no way i could be doing that and so they inspire me they get me <laughs> they get me lit up in there and we have fun i love it i can see it i can see it just the way that you're talking about it how how much how motivating that is as a practitioner is these stories is is what what are so amazing and what are so motivating and and when um we're dealing with things in our life but at the end of the day I can be grateful I got hands I've got feet you know I've I've got a house to live in I've got it's it's the simple things that we often overlook and then when you see people doing that day after day that have gone through way worse than you it's just Okay, well, what's my excuse now, other than oh, yeah. other, other than right here, right here, you yeah, know? Absolutely, absolutely. This is the biggest limitation that we have right here. Um, so I wanted to know well, what are your thoughts about um, combining Eastern wet, uh, medicine with met Western medicine, um, and how we could do that through physical performance and physical therapy, like how can we bridge the two of those? Yeah, um, I think integrating those two, it's, it's open. Uh, I think it's hard when you have, I think the dilemma comes from you have research and science evidence on one, one side, and then you have ancestral stories or folklore that will give you guidance you know in that area but it, it still managed to work even though the evidence isn't there i don't i don't see why do we have to neglect it or why we have to disprove it in that sense of like it's been working for centuries centuries of years and years that why don't we try to apply it to some science based one and i i feel like that's how we first based off and how we're going to get the research done um I'm not that smart enough to do it, <laughs> but we do now.
Mm -hmm. I apologize. I'm trying to figure out how to word it. Complexity of an issue. I'm trying to talk with a simple answer. Yeah, fair enough. Um, what what are some uh, what are some long term goals that you have working in the health space for yourself and? Ooh, that's a real good question. Actually, uh, what about going back to become a physical therapist? Get to work with physical therapists, chiropractors, uh, uh, business. Like, there's all these ideas that I last year, you know, I was just working at and, and I was just like, you know what, I'm just going to become a physical therapist. And what I do for a living, like, let's involve in this. Let's see what I can do to integrate like, human performance. You know, that's how we're talking about. I don't stage performance athlete or uh, elite athlete. I, I want to integrate that into all humans, you know. So in the five years, it's like expanding this multidisciplinary facility and just getting the word out. Because you know we have a team where we're bridging that rehab with performance and fitness. Because now we're seeing them from the beginning stages when it's their injury to seeing them in our group classes to now guiding them through whether it's nutrition, strategies, whether they need other resources. And we just try to be an all-in-one house for them. With people coming into your facility, what are like the most most common injuries or what are some of the, the difficulties that a lot of people are coming in with? Mm, I think... I express it is that there's two communities and they get they get the perspective with fitness with the aesthetic. When they get stuck with the aesthetic mindset of like, I want to look like this person, they don't understand the background of that person. They don't understand maybe even what they may face. You know, if they're seeing a bodybuilder, if they're seeing, you know, a a shredded person with six guys, like what they have to do in order to get that. Sometimes they perceive this idea that I want to look like this person. Where I try to tell myself, we're more of a movement community. You know, I want to see if you can move, you know, comfortably. Can you get in these different positions comfortably? And if so, then let's start working on resistance training. Then we start applying variables from there. And we have different tools that we use from the Kaiser machine, the perch machine, force plate, uh, all these machines to quantify it for that. So that way, and it's nice because it's just like, I didn't do anything to adjust their lifestyle. They just come in, but they let us be who we are. So I'm having an argument with being a strength coach and solely just having this perception as a strength coach when really I'm helping them try to just move. So I like to be called like a movement coach in that sense. Yeah, I love that. It, it is it is movement. Um, if you if you can find a way of moving in a pain free way, then all your other goals are going to follow themselves. But if you find out that you can't move very well when you get up and you have pain, um, it's, mm -hmm. it's going to cause a lot of problems in your life. And I wanted to know um, when it comes to pain and dealing with pain what what are your thoughts around um just the way that we can uh what are what are some simple things that we can do to reduce pain in our movements hmm. good question brody um as i think we all know that pain can be subjective you know one person's soreness can be someone's pain threshold and it's now trying to understand the suffering that they are enduring at that moment. So if it's something that's musculoskeletal, okay, great. We have a physical therapy that can help. If it's something that's neurological, okay, let me send you to somewhere that you can understand is better than I can. Uh, is it something that they don't know what they're feeling, but they just feel the word pain? Say, okay, well, let's talk. Let's see what it is. Let's figure out, let's find the deeper meaning of your pain and then see what so it's like how I like to tell or discuss with some of our guys is that, you know, there's going to be two types of levels. 
suffering that you're going to have to endure to get to your goal or suffering and just live with that suffering that you don't want. Mm -hmm. And um, when it comes to emotions and performance and uh, from an emotional aspect, how, how can you define uh, the importance of how important our emotional state is for achieving our move, movement goals. Oh, it's a big component. I feel like all these things integrated into it. Uh, I mean, and you can have a bad day and you're everything else you just looks like crap, to be honest. Mm -hmm. um, and I don't want it to let it define you on just because of one day. So what we'll usually talk about it is I rather you miss that session, I rather you miss that rep, I rather you miss that set then ultimately never coming back or you know some people will try to push through it because they they know they've done it before in the past but they're just having a bad day like let's not risk it let's not risk it because you know your body's at a stress level already and i'm applying another stressor to it so if i'm applying another stressor on top of you already being stressed I and mean, that's just a bad formula for you to just have a high risk of injury so we'll have a discussion we'll even like sometimes when we're doing our strength portions and they need the adequate rest time, I will just talk to them. I will just talk to them during those three to four minutes just because that way their mind is off of the time because when they're looking at that clock, those three minutes are the longest three minutes for them. And whether they're having a bad day or not, hey, let's figure out what can we do? What's going to make it better today? You're already here in the morning. You're already doing the hardest part. So let's see how we can change that moment, that day into just a bad moment. It's still a bad movie. That's where I try to reduce it, where they're perceiving this day. And, you know, it could be every crappy moment is happening every hour. Or so let's stop it at 2 p.m. 2 p.m., you're here, you're getting the work done. After 3 p.m., when we're done with the other, you'll have the best, better rest of your day. You know? Fantastic. Yeah, it's all about, uh, you know, changing that perspective. What, um, what what are your thoughts about inflammation in, in the body and, and how we can reduce that? Oh, um, I, I actually like this question, rehab facility. Um, a lot of people, you know, it becomes that old thinking that the the ice on the on, on that process is where, you know, it's hurting. Let's put some ice on it. Or uh, and to me, it's like, oh, we're stunning the rehabilitation portion of it. So it's just like. Uh, trying to get educate them in that standard of like the old methodologies and just going into what's evolved now, you know, like here, let's continue trying to move and see what restrictions you have. Or, you know, if it's something that's uh, weight bearing or non weight bearing, let's see what's the, dyna uh, the dynamic of this. Let's go to like again to the root cause of it. Let's not just say, okay, I got a sprained ankle and okay, what if you just rolled it? What if it was, or what if you did? Look at me. Like, let's find out at like, the extreme at, at the point where we have the qualified, you know, screening. Let's figure it out. Uh, don't just allow inflammation just to be that barrier. That's going to be one of the processes that you have to endure in that stressor. Yeah, it's it's funny because I remember going into these physical therapy uh, appointments, and they were all about rice. Uh, what was rest, yeah. rice? Um, I can't remember what the C was. Um, the compression and elevate it. Yeah. So like that has its place. Rice absolutely is helpful, but I don't think it's anywhere near as helpful as, as looking at it from a completely holistic space. Like, okay, well, what's going on with my emotions? What's with my mental state? What's going on with me spiritually? What's going on um, with my diet and nutrition and what I'm putting into my body? And it's crazy because I used to have all these pains, but then uh, when I learned about inflammation and how uh, I I feel better now at 35 or about to be 35 than I did in my 20s because of what I was putting into my body. And then, of course, my mentality as well. Um, I had all these negative thoughts about myself and life. So, um, yeah, I, I guess it's just such a such a dynamic approach. And um, 
I wanted to leave the listeners with you to have the last word and uh, how people can reach out to you as well as um, just some general advice for the future. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so biggest way you can contact me is through my Instagram. Um, it's Angulo. It's A-N-G-U, the number 10, one zero. Um, we also have a page called Apex Fort Worth, Apex Tyler. Um, we also have our foundation, the Adaptive Foundation, which helps certain different athletes from different stages, whether it's amputees, find a bit of the poverty. We're always trying to reach out to the community and show them that, you know, that movement is medicine. Like, if we could find you, we're going to move. And we're going to move optimally. And so, pretty much the last message that I can have for this is to so, so get moving. You know, let's always keep moving forward. It doesn't matter if you're moving forward, backwards, sideways. We're going to get you moving. And if we can find that movement pattern, we're going to keep moving forward at the end of the day, little by little. I love it. Anthony, thanks so much for coming on. And I love your positive outlook and mentality because a positive mentality goes a real long way so i appreciate you coming on and um for anybody who's listening we hope you have a wonderful day thank you brody i appreciate your time man